This is Dr. Mary Chamberlain, and I am here with Mr. Harold Van Patten at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Today is Thursday, June 28, 2018. I'm interviewing Mr. Van Patten as part of the Oral History Project, CDC's Early Response to AIDS. Harold, welcome to the project. Thank you. Do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes. Harold, your career as a CDC public health advisor spanned some 33 years, beginning in 1965. You joined the AIDS program in February 1984, so a little less than three years after publication of the June 1981 Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report on pneumocystis carinii pneumonia among homosexual men. You worked in the AIDS program for 14 years until your retirement in 1998. But after retirement, you remained active in the field as a consultant for CDC, including for the CDC Global AIDS Program. But first, to get started, let's talk a little bit about your background. Could you tell us where you grew up and about your early family life? I was born in Washington, D.C. Um, my parents lived in the Virginia suburbs, so I grew up in the Virginia suburbs, went to both elementary and high school there, and uh, I'm the oldest of three, uh, two younger sisters. Um, my father was uh, a serviceman for the Washington Gaslight Company. My mother worked in the auditing department at Sears, and I went to the University of Virginia, got a degree in a BA degree, a degree in psychology, had no idea what I really wanted to do at that point. When I graduated in 64, 1964, I um, had had a military deferment. Vietnam was beginning to build up at that point. So just after graduation, I got a notice to report for my physical, which I did and I was not anxious to go full-time into the military, so one option I had and what I chose was to try to find a reserve unit to get into you. At that time, you had to find a reserve unit with a vacancy, so I joined the D.C. National Guard, went off to basic training and then advanced infantry training at uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio as a medical corpsman. And when I came back, um, it was in the spring of 1965, there was an ad in the Washington Post, and it said, how would you like a career in public health or something to that effect? And so I responded to that ad and interviewed at the DC Public Health Department uh, for a job with CDC and the, what was at the time called the VD program as a, basically a caseworker doing field investigation, interviews for sex partners and follow-up and contact tracing. Um, do you know, do you have any recall of what sparked your interest in a career in public health? Um, had you considered other avenues? Well, primarily, um, you know, when I was in college, I had worked for a radio station, and I was really anxious to do radio broadcasting, but didn't feel that I was really going to make a career of that. So public health, health sounded, you know, it was in line with my medical corpsman training to some extent. And I thought, yeah, and then when I interviewed, it sounded like something I would like to try. When you, did you have any, what was your experience as a medical corpsman? Um, did you have? Well, there was not, it was, a, it was a general training as a medical corpsman. There was no specific specialty training. Um, but did you have patient care responsibilities? Were you trained for that? Limited, you know, we did procedures on each other during the, during the training. Um, I remember giving another corpsman a an enema and he the same with oh me, so <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing, but, you know, a fake enema, really. Right. Um, so, so you saw this actually posted in the Washington Post newspaper, this advert for a career in public health. 
Um, do you remember who interviewed you at, for the job? Was it anybody that popped up later on in your career at CDC? Um, it was another public health advisor who didn't stay that long after, the, after that. And you know, I, I honestly can't remember his name. I, for some reason, I think his first name was Charlie. But I, I, I couldn't be sure. I did go to interviewing school. I remember Wendell Bradford was uh, uh, teaching that along with, I think, Russ Havlack. And um, when we went to interviewing school in uh, the Chelsea Clinic in New York City. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because, as you said, um, you were hired as a, as a public health advisor to work in the VD control program, which in, involved interviewing case patients and contacts of individuals. So tell us a little bit more about interviewing school in, in the Chelsea New York City Clinic. How, how was that, a, did they approach that? Well, we, um, we spent a week or so just sort of academically talking about the process, what's, what's required, some of the techniques used, and the important aspects of building patient trust, you know, listening to the patient, being, you know, showing some empathy with, with whatever situation they, and challenges that they may be facing, and uh, trying to explain to them the reason for asking this personal information to protect them from becoming reinfected, getting patients who, uh, who may not know that they're infected into the clinic for treatment and that it's handled confidentially and, you know, that we don't give out your name to people when we contact them. And um, so then during the second week, we all took turns interviewing actual patients uh, that it came into the clinic. And I remember my particular patient um, had a contact who had died since the contact. And that we hadn't covered that, so I didn't know how to handle that. I mean, I just, that was a total uh, problem for me to deal with at that point. And uh, so I, I, I asked, where were they buried? And this kind of thing, which, obviously was not that uh, relevant. At, at any rate, uh, it, was, it was interesting. And we, we, we did this behind a, uh, a mirror. And you know, they, the class and the instructor could look on. But you know, with a patient, we were sitting in a room that had a mirror on the wall. And then we would get critiqued and discuss the interview afterwards. So that was sort of how the training went. Were your teachers? fellow public health advisors? They were, they yes. Were. More experienced, but... And this went on, you said, for a month that you had this... It was two weeks oh, two of weeks, training. sorry. Okay. And then what happened next after you had your two-week course under your belt? Well, I went back to North Carolina. There was a, a public health advisor in the area, the eastern North Carolina, that I was covering. and. Did you have any say in your assignment, or were you just Well, when I first got the call from CDC that I had been selected for a position, they were going to send me to any big city in the Northeast, which at that point didn't sound terribly appealing to me. So I said, how about something else? And so they said, we can do Wilson, North Carolina. And so that's, that's where I selected. So I was there for about a year. But a, a more experienced public health advisor spent a week or two with me. We did some training in taking field bloods. And, uh, you know, I did some more observing with, with him handling patients. And, at that, and after a few weeks, he was transferred and, and went someplace else. So you were flying I'm solo? I'm kind of on my own, right. Um, what would a typical day be like for you in um, the VD programs as an assignee in these states? Well, you had certain days of the week that you had clinic uh, in a more rural area, and you would go to clinic and you would see patients that have 
been to, through the clinic. In some of the rural areas, we may even do some of the initial screening of patients before the doctor comes in and decides what, what the treatment or course of, of uh, treatment may be. And uh, then afterwards, we would um, interview them for sex partners. And then you would write up the interview on, on forms that were standardized forms and then uh, follow up uh, in the field and make notes of, of your steps to try to find people who were who are named in the, in the uh, process. And then you'd go out and tell them basically that someone who knows you has been treated for a, uh, an infectious disease and we wanted to make sure that you are okay because from we understand that you've had contact with this person. We'd like to make sure that you're okay. Many people can have this infection and not have any outward signs and symptoms, not know, not know about it. And I can remember one patient I had. And it, um, I said, someone who knows you. And she says, nose? There's nothing wrong with my nose. And, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you, you get all kinds of situations like that. Yeah, I was wondering, um, going out literally knocking on doors, trying to find people, could potentially lead to some interesting encounters, I'm sure, or, or potentially things that maybe were a little bit frightening. Did you have any sorts of experiences uh, out there in your after, misadventures? <laughs> after, uh, after a year, I was transferred to Baltimore. And uh, that was quite a different setting, you know, in, in dealing with patients. Um, you know, going from a rural setting where you would have migrant workers, you might have uh, people who, and, and I remember you would, you would ask somebody, um, where do they live if, if you were looking for them? And they said, they don't live here. And do you know them? Well, yes. And uh, where do they live now? Oh, well, they're down the road. Well, I learned later that down the road was like in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or someplace like that. But anyway, in, in Baltimore, you, uh, you would um, knock on doors of rural houses and somebody might stick their head out of the third floor window and say, yeah, what do you want? And, uh, you know, you'd have to say something to the effect that, well, you know, it's kind of a private matter. Unless you want everybody to know your business, maybe I should come in and talk to you. And um, so. When you went on these um, visits, were you, what were you counseled in terms of how you should dress? I mean, if you show up in a, in a, in a coat and tie, you're obviously going to be not fitting into the neighborhood. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm just curious how you approach Well, I, I think, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally wear a coat and tie and dress formally, but you would be casually dressed yet kind of smartly casually dressed because, you know, you do want them to know you're representing an, an official agency as opposed to just there for, for some other purpose. And a lot of times you would say, the insurance man is here or, you know, that, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that, but people in the family would say, well, the insurance man must be here, you know, or I'd say I was with the health department, but, uh, you know. Now, You've already mentioned two locations. How many uh, different areas were you assigned to as part of the VD control program? After Baltimore, I went to Detroit. I was there for about 15 months, I think. After that, I spent 11 years in Texas in three different locations, a year in Abilene, Texas, five years in Fort Worth, and five years in Dallas. And then I went to Arkansas and was in Arkansas, Little Rock, for uh, three years before I joined the AIDS program. Now, what was the, the reason for frequent moving around? Why were public health advisors typically not assigned in a given area more than two years or so? I think it's a strength of the public health advisor program at CDC to get experience in different locations, you, it, it's, it's a different experience in every place you go. You get different management that's 
in charge. You get low, you're responsible not only to your CDC supervisor, but to a local supervisor. And so you have to sort of fit in between the two and make sure that you're placating both your actual supervisor at CDC as well as uh, the, uh, the local people. And uh, it wasn't always that they were in total agreement, but anyway, it was, it was, it was fun, actually, and, and quite, and I, I found it challenging. But, you know, in Detroit, uh, that was, I was there just after the riots in 1960. The riots, I think, were in 67. And in fact, the social hygiene clinic uh, on the grounds of Ford Hospital uh, there were people actually, National Guardsmen, up on top of the building shooting at the time of the riots. So, uh, but I was there after that, fortunately. But uh, it wasn't the most friendly atmosphere for a while. And then after that, I went to Texas, and I was in Abilene, and I covered a 41 county of West Texas. Uh, so you spend a lot of time driving from one location to another. Um, and, you know, it was not uncommon to find a sign that said, next gas, 50 miles, you know. Uh, but anyway, it, and, and then after that, I was in Fort Worth and Dallas. And as you move along, you generally become, have an increasingly responsible role in terms of supervising mm -hmm. other staff, uh, beginning to write grant applications, um, and, uh, actually ended up in Arkansas as being sort of the state manager of the VD control program there. Now, along the way, I'm presuming that you acquired a family, and so it wasn't just you that were moving every few years. Actually, in Baltimore, I, I married, uh, and uh, um, my wife says that was an arranged marriage because she was working at Sears, my mother was working at Sears, and she introduced us. and. My mother told me one day, I have this uh, young lady I'm working with at Sears that uh, I would like for you to meet. So we met her, and uh, I called her and asked her out. And you know, she says, oh, you don't have to do this, you know? I mean, <laughs> and I said, no, I want to. And so we went on it. And she was actually scheduled to leave Sears and go to be a stewardess for Pan Am at the time. And um, so I. I asked her to marry, I guess, within a few weeks after meeting her, uh, which was very fast. But, uh, you know, I think I met her in, like, October, and we were married in February. But uh, anyway, she didn't go to Pam. Pam <laughs> so she had other uh, domestic travel, <laughs> traveling yes. around, uh, yes. seeing some of the, the highlights. Um. And our son was born in Abilene. Okay. We have one son. Okay, because I guess I would think that would be, in one way, hard for kids, but I guess it also teaches them some resilience to be moving around. Yes, and you know, fortunately, our son was starting first grade as we moved to Dallas, and so we were there for five years, so he went through most of his elementary school in, in Dallas, and middle school in Arkansas, and then high school in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I guess before we move on from, from your, the STD part of your um, career, I just wondered if there were any particular hot button STD issues before AIDS um, where there, I th wasn't this a time when there was a real effort to sort of eradicate venereal disease? Syphilis, syphilis? yeah. I mean, we, we were working more, it was a more concentrated effort on contact tracing with syphilis. Gonorrhea was was much more widespread and very so many cases it would be very difficult to to do contact tracing on every patient. Primarily, we interviewed the patients and uh, promoted self referral of their contacts to the clinic. But syphilis patients, we actually worked with more um, um, more in depth and. Um, there were a, a few, I, I remember with gonorrhea, there actually was a, an issue that developed in, oh, I would say the late 70s, pelvic inflammatory disease was becoming a big 
a big issue and uh, uh, sort of a hidden aspect of complications of gonorrhea in a woman until it became, you know, more, more of a real problem. Uh, so there was, there was work being done on that. And um, the, the other thing is that we would have what we called blitzes on syphilis where there was a particular outbreak in a major area we might go on a temporary deployment to uh, another area. I know when I was in Abilene, I went to Dallas for several weeks to work on a quote unquote blitz there. Uh, when I was in Arkansas, I went to Miami. There was quite an outbreak among the Haitian community there and spent some time there working on a, on a blitz. Um, but so, so that kind of thing. And then um, herpes became, a, became an issue about the time I was uh, genital herpes. Um, about the time that I was beginning to think about moving on. Were you able to show that these blitzes were actually effective in, in reducing the... In most the instances, they, the they did reduce the, the caseload. Um, but, you know, it, it's still, it, it's one of those diseases that we were never able to just totally wipe out, and uh, it's still around, so. Before we move on to AIDS, um, in the midst of all of this, you, you took a little bit of a detour um, because you had an opportunity to work in smallpox eradication, that big effort. Can you tell us how that all came about? I was in Fort Worth at the time, and I guess CDC was participating with WHO, and there were a lot of public health advisors who volunteered for like three-month temporary assignments, along with physicians as well, to go to some of the countries where smallpox was still endemic, uh, where it had been wiped out in many parts of the world there were still hot spots, and one of those was India and Bangladesh. And so we had a, a number of public health advisors who went on three-month TDYs to either India or Bangladesh. And in 1975, I think it was May of 1975, I went to Bangladesh and spent about three months there. And most of my time was in Bogra, Bangladesh, which is kind of northern, eastern, um, I guess northern western Bangladesh and um, that's where I first met actually Don Francis uh, who was there <clears throat> at the time he uh, we, we flew from Bang, uh, from uh, Dhaka to maybe midpoint to Bogra on Bangladesh Biman Air, Airways and uh, got off the plane there and then we had to go part way by river and Don was in a boat, and uh, he met us at the, at the dock there, and we rowed a ways through the river and across the river and up the river a bit, and then we took a vehicle on to Bogra. And uh, so uh, when I saw Don when I first came in to AIDS at, uh, um, in 1984, you know, we remembered oh, seeing each other there. But anyway, um, the theory was that we would, since there were still active cases there and endemic cases that would just pop up, it wasn't a widespread epidemic at that time, but we would pay people 50 taka in the local currency, which um, um, I, I don't know how much that would be, not a lot by American standards, but by their standards, it was quite a, quite a nice some, uh, to report cases of suspected smallpox. And of course, we went to a few weeks of training beforehand to uh, get some insight into trying to look at smallpox and identify it and uh, differentiate between um, chickenpox and, and that kind of thing. But anyway, um, we would pay people to report cases. These are people in the village? You would go right, to the village people in the village uh, to, to, re, 
report a case in their village. We would go out, confirm whether or not it was a case. If it did appear to be a case, we would set up a containment. We would have health workers vaccinate the entire village, appoint someone as a house guard. Since there was no treatment, we just basically wanted to isolate the patient. We would also appoint vaccinators for the village and anytime anyone visited or anyone that we may have missed when we did the mass vaccination of the village uh, to vaccinate them. And uh, then we would go back and make unannounced periodic visits just to see if the patient was still there. Sometimes you'd find the patient was out in the field working or they had gone to visit someone and you know that complicated things. But most of the time they were uh, there. And then at the end of the outbreak when the patient had either died or recovered, um, we had like a payment day. I think back and, you know, I had this bag that I carried along with my interpreter and this bag, we would go to the bank and get money, which, you know, filled the bag to pay off all of the people in the village that had worked during the outbreak. And I often think, gosh, I could have been robbed, you know, driving on my little Suzuki motorbike with my interpreter on the back, and, but nothing really like that ever happened. That, but uh, How did you go about, when you were in a village, figuring out how to select the patient, uh, excuse me, the people in the village that you wanted to be case reporters? I mean, would, can, did you just sort of show up and you, get you, the village elder to kind of convene people, or how did that all work? Well, you know, I think any time a white person showed up there, you know, there was always a crowd around. And so you would ask for volunteers or you may just select someone and, um, you know, show them. Were people them. cooperative for the most part? For or? the most part. I know that um, I had one situation where we vaccinated a village and then after we had cleared the village, um, I got a report that there was a case there again. So I went back. It turns out that there was a, a small child, not, not an infant, but not yet walking maybe, um, who had smallpox. And it turns out that she had hid her child when they vaccinated the village because she didn't want it to suffer the pain of the, of the vaccination. So, uh, so that kind of thing happened. But, and after, I don't know, I would say maybe seven weeks or so, six to seven weeks, I guess things died down enough that they had an area that I guess was hotter that they asked me to move to Siraj Ganj, which was a little farther south. And um, that's where I spent the rest of my time there. I also developed, I guess, a case of, I, I went to a, uh, a wedding from one of the local health workers. And uh, I think I drank something that probably was contaminated because I ended up with amoebiasis. So, um, or what we think was amoebiasis. I don't think it was ever lab confirmed, but the course of flagell on the way home seemed to take care of it. But uh, not not a good memory of the of of, uh, of your of your tour of duty there. Um, I'm just curious because. This is a time when there's no cell phones, there are no faxes. You're talking about being on a motor scooter, going from village to village. How did, how did you all, when you were, went out to these fairly remote areas, how did you end up communicating back to wherever central headquarters was, so to speak? How did all that work? During my stay there, we... Um we actually had visits from physicians or other people who had contact with uh, DACA. And we actually had made two trips back to DACA during the, the stay there to talk to Stan Foster, Andy Agle, and uh, the people who were in charge of the program there. Uh, all of us were seconded to WHO, but uh, uh, so we worked through WHO uh, as CDC employees. Um, but anyway, um, and I remember there was another visit from 
that came, the people, group of people came through. Uh, D.A. Henderson, among others, uh, made a visit there and stopped. Um, and, you know, you, you discuss what's going on and how things are going and, and that type of thing. But there was also a central reporting of the cases and, you know, the outcome and, and that type of thing went to, there was like a weekly summary of cases reported. I, I was, uh, re I spent some time myself in Bangladesh and I was smiling as you were describing the various modes of transportation because getting around in Bangladesh was half of the adventure uh, because it just such, uh, so much water, the rivers, it's so low lying. True, and uh, the latter part of my stay there was beginning of monsoon season. And so some of these villages, in order to reach them, you might have to commandeer a boat somehow to get there, you know. And we had frequent ferry crossings and you would drive your motorbike or we also had a Mahindra Jeep that there were three of us uh, that were actually stationed in Bogra at one time and then we split up later on, but um, there, um, there were times when you'd get on this ferry that was just kind of a makeshift wooden small logs pulled together by rope and, you know, it was... <laughs> sort of a take your life in your own sure. hands kind of moment. Yeah, and for, I mean, fortunately, most of the rivers and streams were, were fairly narrow, so it wasn't like you were crossing major streams like that. But. So you had quite a few adventures, domestic and international, before, before you actually uh, started working in the HIV AIDS program. And, and I guess maybe we should turn our, our focus on that. Um, so I'm curious, you were in the field MMWR came out in 1981. Since you were working in STD control, had you or your colleagues prior to the MMWR started to hear about unusual diseases that were occurring in gay men? Um, Nothing prior to the MMWR. I was in Arkansas um, from 81 to 84. and. Uh, in Dallas, I don't rem I was in Dallas for the five years prior to uh, Arkansas. I don't remember um, running into anything that we that that was going on at that time that would lead us to believe there was something very unusual going on. I'm I, I maybe perhaps among the medical community outside of the clinic, but uh, nothing that, nothing that, that I was, was aware of. Your way. Right. So it was February 84 when you came in from the field to work in Atlanta and the AIDS program. How did that all come about that you got this headquarters position? Well, CDC would announce vacancies to the field, and there was a vacancy for three public health advisors to uh, join the AIDS program. And you know, I had been at that point almost 20 years in the STD program and uh, decided that it would be nice to have maybe a different challenge. And I was also interested in how things were handled at headquarters at CDC and decided that I would apply for the job. As it turns out, Larry Zyla was doing the interviews. Uh, he was already in the AIDS program. And uh, he interviewed me in Arkansas. And uh, I had known Larry. We had both worked in Texas. He was in Houston when I was in Dallas, or Fort Worth, maybe. But we would see each other at meetings in Austin at the State Health Department. And uh, so I, I knew Larry from, from that setting. and. Uh, after the interview, I was called and said that I had been selected, and so I was off to Atlanta. And what was the, your initial position in the, in the AIDS program? What were your responsibilities? Um, CDC had just awarded 17 cooperative agreements, I believe, to uh, 
major cities and states that had impact had impact from HIV and AIDS, or, or as it was known then, just the um, I guess the acquired Im immune deficiency syndrome. But uh, um, and these cooperative agreements were for what purpose? They were for surveillance of AIDS cases. Uh, to get them reported to CDC so we could get some idea of, of how pervasive this problem was, where it was, and uh, to get a handle on how, how it was, you know, to get a picture of the epidemic. Um, and so, you know, the major cities and states, and so the field unit was set up, and it was Larry Zyla, Dave Colley, and myself who did the monitoring of these cooperative agreements. We would review the quarterly reports that came in. We would make site visits. Uh, we would also uh, review their annual applications for funding, uh, make recommendations for funding. And then at the time negotiations were carried out with the state, we would go over to the grants management office at Buckhead where it was then. and. Uh, uh, along with the grants management officer, negotiate with the state officials on the funding level and uh, come up with a final figure for the cooperative agreement. Some of the cooperative agreements also had field assignees in lieu of cash. That's one, one thing that they call, well, one reason I believe that they call it a cooperative agreement rather than just a grant is that a cooperative agreement you can assign CDC staff in lieu of cash to the local setting, which was what they did in the VD program or STD program before that. But um, I remember we had some field assignees in New York and uh, LA, San Francisco, and maybe a few other key areas. But. Yeah, I wanted to unpick this a little bit because uh, I went back to try and set the scene, at least in my head, a little bit. Um, so about the time that you moved to the AIDS program in early 84, there were about 3,000 cases that had been reported to CDC from 42 different states. But still, the vast majority, over 80%, were coming from New York, California, New Jersey, and Florida. So there was this real interest in determining if there were other cases occurring. Right outside of these, at the time, big epicenters. Um, and so, since you had such a, a, a key role in the mechanism of making this happen, can you break it down a little bit as to what the steps that health departments would have to do to navigate a successful application for a cooperative agreement? Uh, because it was, there were, uh, eligibility criteria and all of that because uh, you wanted your awardees to be successful. So can you break it down a little bit more for us? Yeah, I don't know that I remember the specific criteria for eligibility, but obviously the number of cases that and indications of, of, of problems and the number, uh, number of cases would be a factor. Uh, their ability to to show that they could take some action to outreach to hospitals, to physicians who may see patients at risk, uh, gay men, drug users, um, and their application would have to include what methods, what activities that they would uh, and envision that they would carry out within the coming year and goals and objectives that they would set to try to meet uh, in order to receive funding for the for a cooperative agreement and I think the the priority was areas where it was most prevalent at, at least in our thinking that would uh, probably receive the the funding um, it, um, now, when these applications came in, there was a formal review process, as I recall. There was, yes. We would get, we would, um, 
uh, Dave and Larry and I would uh, make inquiries at CDC for people who worked in similar kinds of projects to be part of a panel to review the application, do an objective review of the application, and recommend whether they think this application is feasible, is it, should it move forward, uh, is it likely to succeed, that type of thing. And then um, once that recommendation, or those re recommendations had been collected, we would, in general, follow the ranking. They would score these applications, and we would follow the, the ranking of the scoring from the review panel. And um, with justification, you could skip a place or you know change somebody's standing within that um, in that order. But generally, we followed the the uh, the recommendations. And then the funding level, and we're getting into the nitty gritty detail of what exactly was going to be funded and what we had money to to support um, would have to be taken into consideration and considered uh, at the time we did the negotiations with the state. Now this cooperative agreement mechanism uh, was utilized in other programs like STD oh, yes. immunization, it was. so yes. this was a tried and true Yes, this approach. was a, an approach that had been used widely throughout CDC to the, in, in providing assistance to the states. Now when you, when you started, you said there were 17 of these in place but then this just continued to expand. It did. Um, when I first got there to CDC, we were in building six in a um, kind of, I, I think it used to be chimpanzee cages when, back when uh, CDC had the chimpanzees. Uh, you know, cinder block walls, concrete floors and anyway file cabinets sitting in the hall and you know it was uh, but so we were operating at you know kind of on a shoestring really but at, uh, as time went on and more and more it became clear that this was spreading into more than to be just more than just a, a gay disease and a drug user disease blood recipients were becoming infected, hemophilia patients were becoming infected, contacts, partners of, of heterosexual contacts of patients were becoming infected, children were becoming infected. It, uh, it began to become more politically visible and funding began to become more available. And so we gradually expanded, moved to other off-campus uh, offices at Executive Park, and um, we expanded the, the program. By 1988, I think, we moved to uh, Executive Park, and our surveillance unit, uh, I went into surveillance at, I believe, in, in 88, um, and our surveillance unit had expanded to the point where uh, originally, I think there were like four or five people in surveillance. It, this, there were probably 25 people or so in surveillance. We had physicians who had responsibilities for given areas across the country, in addition to public health advisors in the field unit. And uh, by this time, we were getting a number of public inquiries about data on AIDS. And by this time, it was HIV infection. and. There were the criteria for the reporting of AIDS progressed over over the years, and um, I had Congress staffers who would call at that time. CDC didn't have a communications office and a you know a response office to deal with these kinds of public inquiries. And congressional staffers would call and say, Congressman so and so or Senator so and so needs this information by four o'clock this afternoon. Broken down into small cells and you know we would have to say you know we cannot give out small cell data because of privacy concerns if you you know report this small cell data in by geographic area it lends itself to the identification of, of patients which we we don't do you know so uh, anyway 
Uh, at the same time, there was interest in doing zero surveillance mm -hmm. among risk groups, uh, prenatal screening, screening in bars, people who were going to TB clinics and, uh, you know, a, a number of areas and wherever we could get information. And so there was actually a zero surveillance unit set up that sort of went hand in hand with the surveillance unit, but <clears throat> a separate unit. So the portfolio of work, obviously, over time is expanding tremendously. And as you said, more staff are coming on board. Did, for the, for the cooperative agreements that went out to the eventually all 50 states and big cities, territories, were each of the public health advisors sort of assigned uh, to a, a, a portfolio of different cooperative agreements. So you Correct. would be man yes. managing right. over time. I'm not sure how many you'd be managing. Um, you know, a prob few. probably a public health advisor would handle maybe 10 or 15 states. If, if, if by the time we were doing all 50 states, it was That's probably 10, maybe 10 cooperative agreements that they might cover. I want to I want to go back a little bit and have you expand on a couple of points. You mentioned as part of the responsibilities would be to go out into the field and conduct site visits. So the, the state or the city applies, the award is made, but then typically headquarters went out and did site visits. Tell me what a typical site visit was like. What were you trying to assess and how did you go about doing it? Well, primarily we were trying to see what challenges that the local area was running into whether perhaps another area had had the same challenge, and maybe they had found a, a solution for, for handling that, maybe not. Maybe we found several areas were facing that same challenge. Uh, but also to get a handle on whether they were doing enough outreach into the physician community, the hospital community, um, other clinics that might be seeing AIDS patients, outreach to gay bars, um, you know, to the to the community at risk itself, and um, to see what what they were actually doing, and, and and in terms of what they had written as their objectives and what they had planned to do, whether they were following through on those plans. Um, but at any rate, you know, we would try to make sure that they were you know, offering incentives, incentives that, that, you know, gave people a, Would they take you report. out to some of their locations? Uh, yes, Would you actually get to meet some of the local reporters, be it in a hospital or a clinician's office? We would actually uh, get to uh, do some site visits. Um, you know, I remember going to San Francisco General Hospital and um, meeting some of the well, staff people there. who were doing the, the surveillance in the field, uh, were, they, were they excited about this? I mean, what? Oh, yes. I think people, uh, people in general were, I mean, it was still kind of an unknown in, in many ways, and people were anxious to see, you know, are we going to be able to control this? Are we going to have a treatment, a vaccine? How, is, how, are, how are we going to, to deal with this? We don't know a lot about it yet. We know a lot, but not, not enough, not enough. And so we need to, to so it keep wasn't, going. It wasn't just kind of a routine number counting. People had more of a passion about it, is what you're saying. They did, yes. And there was passion among the community uh, at risk. I mean, particularly among the gay community. I mean. There was fear, there was concern about privacy, there was concern uh, for cohorts that, and colleagues that they had that might be infected, and uh, it was still an unknown. You know, the incubation period was a long period, and... Um, and as you said, for a time, there were new risk groups being identified, and so that right. was all very alarming, actually. Uh, not to have a, a, a good handle on, on transmission at the time. Um, you mentioned this when we were talking about 
your work in the STD program, and I'm assuming it carried through to the AIDS program, that there's, there's this delicate balance in relationships in, between federal and state health authorities. Uh, in the cooperative agreement is, is, a, is a perfect example of this. Um, and I'm wondering, and sometimes these are tricky relationships, I'm just wondering if you encountered, uh, found yourself caught up in any uh, oh, delicate balancing acts uh, about managing the, the state's concerns and the federal's con concerns. There were any issues that you got caught up in trying to keep everybody one big happy family, so to speak. Well, actually, I do remember an incident after I was in AIDS surveillance, and by this time we were doing seroprevalence studies in some of the areas, and one of the recipients, it was the, it was the state of North Dakota, actually, um, the state epidemiologist was unhappy with the level, fund, you know, level of funding that they had received for their cooperative agreement and disagreed very strongly with something that had been cut, a request for funding that had been cut from part of its seroprevalence work, and felt strongly enough about it to write a letter to Dr. Mason, the director of CDC, about it. And so, of course, that came down through the uh, ranks to uh, the program level uh, to deal with. and. Uh, so I was selected to uh, be the one to go out and talk to the state epidemiologist. And of course it happened to be in December, Bismarck, North Dakota, snowstorm, minus 50 degrees wind chill, uh, wind blowing, and you know, I, I land there and you know, go to my hotel, but the next day we go to the state health department and I met the state epidemiologist and the regional rep of HHS from Denver was also there at the, at the meeting. And um, so, you know, I reached out to shake hands with the state epidemiology and he, or epidemiologist and he refused to shake hands with me at the time. Anyway, we went into a meeting and the, the three of us actually, it was the state epidemiologist, the HHS, regional rep and myself. And so he explained his position and he said, I really would, I would like to know what, what are you going to do about it? And uh, the HHS representative, who I thought might be helpful to me, actually said, yeah, Harold, I want to know, what are you going to do about it? Um, so as it turns out, we, uh, I promised to go back and we would consider his arguments for, for the funding, and perhaps we could compromise somehow on, on providing some of the funding, it, maybe not all of it, but, and so I think that's how we ended up, and we probably ended up funding partially that, that aspect that he wanted uh, funded, and he did shake my hand when we left, so. <laughs> Ever the diplomat <laughs> that you were, oh gosh. Um, one other little, uh, well, not little, but another point that I wanted you to expand a little bit on that you mentioned had to do with um, the concerns about reporting of cases, uh, initially with names. I think by the time you arrived, named reporting to CDC from state health departments had probably stopped because early case reports to CDC did come with names and then this, this was replaced with a, a coding system, if you will. Um, so can you just elaborate a little bit more? Even without names, there were still concerns about indirect ways, I guess, to identify people. You, Congress, why would Congress, they would be calling and asking for? Well, you know, congressmen from specific districts would say, I want to know how many cases have occurred in my district and or in these counties, by county, by age, race, sex, you know, this type of thing. He wanted that kind of breakdown. And in areas where there were limited numbers of cases, particularly counties that were mm. rural counties, or 
you know, they may have one or two patients and you start giving information like this is a 37-year-old white male. Um, With hemophilia or something. Yeah. And the next thing you know, people are identifying who that case is, even though they don't have the name. They, can, they have enough information to figure out that lives in this county. Um, they begin to put two and two together, and people know the names of people who are infected. And, you know, it's, that would go counter to, you know, once, once we break confidentiality and that gets among the general public, then that becomes an issue that reporting is going to really fall off. Would you but, get a lot of pushback from some of these congressional staffers that rang Some out? of them were more forceful than others. Most of them were understanding, but, uh, you know, it, as long as we could give them something, most of them were, would, would be happy with that, but uh, a few people were a little more forceful. But in the end, I don't think I had anybody who just absolutely created a big uproar about mm -hmm. it. But it was, a, it was a major concern. You know, the Soundex system gave you clues to the name, even though it wasn't, it wasn't the name. Um, at any rate, and the other issue with the Soundex system, sometimes patients would travel from one state to another frequently, and you never knew if you were getting duplicate reports if you couldn't actually compare by name, date of birth, and, and this type of thing. Um, so it, it created an issue of uh, how accurate are we actually if, if we aren't able to be sure that we aren't getting duplicate, duplicate reportings from two different states or even from two different counties within the same state, which happened, I think. Mm -hmm. I know the states could, um, if there were concerns, I think the state health departments would talk to each other, try and resolve if right. there was duplicate reporting, but certainly not something we could do at the federal level. Besides um, this very full portfolio of, of managing the cooperative agreements, doing site visits, uh, keeping the peace uh, out there, did you have other responsibilities or did your job change over time? Well, there were, there were times when um, things came up that needed to be done and there really wasn't somebody who was dedicated to doing that particular job. So. I, along with other public health advisors, would be asked to take on some of this. One of the things that happened early on, a lot of people wrote letters and, oh, we have found the cure for AIDS and we want you to try this or do this and we know what, what needs to be done. Or they would complain about, oh, these people are just gays and drug users. Why are we fo spending government money on these people? Uh, and, of course, these all had to be responded to. And we would develop some stock paragraphs that could be incorporated into personalized responses to each of those kinds of letters. And then some, you know, were somewhat unique and you really had to, to deal with on an individual basis. But uh, that was one, one thing that came along. So individual uh, letters. I mean, to me, that's the volume of what must came in, to me, this is just astounding that people really did get. Well, and I mean, more than it. one person did that, but, you know, it was, it was divided um, up among several Other duties staff. as assigned as right. we say in government work. Right. And I remember it must have been maybe about 1986. I know that Jim Curran was representing CDC on a panel of AIDS advisories that advisors from the various health agencies within the federal government. Uh, and they would meet quarterly in Washington. There would be a representative, Jim from CDC, um, I think Dr. Fauci from NIH, and uh, FDA had a representative, the Surgeon General. Um, Walter Reed had a representative, or the Department of Defense. and. Um, HRSA, Health Resources Services Administration, uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, and probably NCHS, the National Center for Health Statistics, um, all were represented on this, on this panel that met quarterly. And 
Jim was looking for someone to accompany him and take notes of what happened at the meeting and write up these notes. And um, then make notes of what obligations we may have for reporting back to the panel when, when we meet again or getting back to them in, me, in the meantime with other information that people were requesting or wanted to communicate about. So uh, he or someone asked me to go along and, and take that assignment on, which I did for about a year. And, uh, so you were like a fly on the wall with all these really high level People. I remember, yeah, that visiting uh, um, Antonio. What was her name? Antonia. The oh, Novello. Novello. Yes, we were in her office she for a visit one time. She was a surgeon general. At the she time? was a surgeon general at the time. Um, so we had a, a, a visit there, which was interesting because at about the same time, I think her husband was on Saturday Night Live. And doing, he did impersonations. I can't remember his name, but you know, it was. And and she was she was a very entertaining person to talk to. But uh, uh, um, I'm not trying to put you on the hot seat or anything like that. But so this, as you said, was in the '80s, I guess, mid to late '80s that you started doing this. Were these contentious meetings? Uh, were people at odds with one another, or? Because you've got high-level representatives from the key right. public health agencies. I don't remember any uncivil conversations, <laughs> well, but good. there obviously were um, boundaries that people were trying to protect, and you know, that's our responsibility, or mm. you know, that kind Perfect. of thing. But yeah, sir, you know. Was surf CDC on the hot seat for any particular things? Do you recall that? Um, you know, that's been, what, 30 years ago. I'm, uh, I, I, I can't say that I remember any specific issues. That's fine. But, but it, 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 as I said, it must have been like being a fly on the wall to sort of see how uh, people interacted at these, at these very high levels. Um, what was the work environment like working at headquarters? I'm, Obviously, a lot of work, long hours. Did you feel a lot of pressure? Was it was it a stressful environment? I'm just kind of curious what what it was like to be on the the corridors of Building Six or. Actually, it was. I found it quite rewarding. Actually, the I, I think the very positive aspect of that, even though we were kind of a stepchild without a lot of funding, and were working with on a shoestring resource basis, um, everybody had kind of come together from different areas of CDC. And we were all working together for a common goal. And there was very, a very calm, you know, a very much of a camaraderie um, among the staff. Uh, there was, I, I don't remember issues among staff that, uh, you know, there were issues that happened between, say, our activity and, you know, other people who might have a turf issue or something like that, but uh, uh, nothing that I remember that was, um, it, it was really basically, uh, everybody was working to, to really mm -hmm. get this done. And even though it was a lot of work, it was rewarding. And, and I, uh, I uh, don't regret it all those years. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, some international opportunities that you had uh, during your time in, in the AIDS program. Uh, uh, you, you undertook a, a short detail and, a, and then a longer two-year secondment. Both of these assignments were in Africa. Um, so I wondered, maybe we could talk about them individually because they happened at uh, different points in time. So I think your first foray to Africa was a, was a detail in November, December, 1987, uh, working with Projet Sida in Kinshasa, Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so how did this all come about? Um, John Mann had started Projet Sida, Jonathan Mann, Dr. Jonathan Mann, um, and I think 
I, I don't remember exactly when he left there. I, I, I think he was there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about 86, 87, early 87, maybe late 86 that he left. I think it started in 84, if I remember correctly. Yes. And um, I think he had pretty much a small staff. He had worked, you know, the, the project was an agreement not only with CDC and the, the government of Zaire at the time, now the DRC, um, but um, NIH was also, they had a presence there for lab and uh, the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Brussels, uh, Peter Piat and Maria Laga were, were, uh, were there. I don't, Tom, was it Tom Quinn? Yes, Tom Quinn from NIH. Yes, was, yep. was there. And um, that's where I first met those people mm -hmm. and uh, during that two month stay. But anyway, John left in 86 or early 87, I believe. Robin Ryder took over at that point uh, when Jonathan Mann left. And I think he, Jonathan went to uh, WHO. Then um, Robin, I think, began to expand things gradually and wanted some assistance, you know, with operations, management. Sort of administrative uh, type of assistance. Right. And working with the embassy and doing liaison with the embassy. Um, CDC at that time had been a domestic agency. You know, we had some international immunization projects, but those were all conducted through the auspices of USAID. And CDC had no real experience in dealing with embassies and the support that embassies give to agencies who are operating in country. Um, and so I don't think Robin had any real understanding of how the embassy and the agency relationships uh, worked. And for that matter, it was really new to me also. Um, obviously, the agency can't just go over there, spend money, hire people uh, without some authority to do this and pay them and, you know, the financial arrangements and ordering equipment, paying for equipment and, and this type of thing. And all of that is done through the embassy. And so I remember when I got there, I think Tom Leonard was on a TDY before me. Public health advisor. Public health advisor, right. And then I followed him for a couple of months. Did you volunteer? Yes, yes. I uh, uh, actually volunteered to go. Um, and um, when I got there, Robin told me, he said, I have arranged with a local contractor to do a $100,000 renovation um, at the hospital. I assume it was Mama Yamo Hospital. And um, I don't remember for sure. And he said, I need for you to deal with the embassy to make sure we can get him paid and, and that type of thing. And so um, in my naivety, you know, I approached the general services officer and said that, uh, Robin has uh, agreed with a, a local contractor to do a $100,000 renovation on the hospital. And the lady who was the GS officer, uh, GSO officer said, uh, general services officer, said to me, he did what? <laughs> and um, so I explained what we needed to do. And in all fairness to the embassies, you know, there are proper ways to do all of these things. But CDC, having operated totally domestically in the past, we had limited authorities for any kind of operations overseas. But the embassies were sympathetic and it actually was, I found, easier to get things done overseas than, than some of the bureaucratic issues that you faced here at, at domestically. But I mean, they had a financial management office, they had a a uh, general services contracting office, uh, purchasing office, uh, personnel office. Uh, so anyway, we uh, we began to set up 
ways to, to deal with that. And, you know, she said, I'll have to draw up a contract and, you know, with specific terms and, you know, in order for us to be able to get this paid. But they were sympathetic to what we wanted. And once you have good communication between the embassy and your, your agency and what you want to do and why you need to do it, and if they understand, they're going to generally support. If, it's, if it seems a reasonable thing to do, they're going to support. And even if it means bending the rules a little bit, they'll find a way to, to get it done. So it was a kind of a learn by doing thing. That's it very, was. That's very interesting to contemplate uh, because now it's just a given that CDC operates internationally. But AIDS was, I, from what you're saying, Harold, it sounds like AIDS was really where we cut our teeth in learning how to go about doing I, it. I really believe it was, yes. I, 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 as I said, I know there were immunization projects that were done internationally, but for the most part, my understanding is that they were done mm. either through WHO secondment or through USAID support in the field. So when you got to Kinshasa, what, what was the, uh, what were the working conditions like? Uh, you, you mentioned the hospital, which was a, a key site, as I recall, for, for where a lot of these studies were done, uh, epidemiologic and laboratory studies, but what kind of general facilities did you find when you got there? Well, I mean, the hospital, it was my first real exposure. Well, I mean, I, I saw some rather um, primitive facilities in Bangladesh, but, you know, looking at the hospital facilities in uh, Kinshasa was uh, kind of an eye-opener in terms of, you know, they had family support that came there. There were no meals provided for patients. Family brought the meals in. They provided whatever the patient needed. There were practically no supplies to be provided. Um, so it was... Did you have computers there? We did have in the office. We did have an office setting we had, I know, a driver or two. We had some, some staff there that had been hired locally through the embassy. Uh, but um, it was not a large staff. And so there, there was an office. Um, and NIH succeeded in setting up a local laboratory there? They did, I think, actually. I, I, I don't remember the details of the facility, but they were doing studies there, I know. And, okay. uh, and I don't know if they were doing like the more uh, routine types testing there and then sending more complicated specimens back to NIH for further processing or, or how that was done, to tell you the truth. Did, was business conducted in French? Did you have to know French to, to work there? I was not French speaking, but it was conducted in French um, for the most part, although the local people who were hired spoke English for the most part. Um, and um, I was able to manage for the two months. Um, okay. So besides uh, getting the $100,000 contract, <laughs> uh, the wheels turning to get that in, in motion, did? Did you have any other specific responsibilities, just trying to, I guess, set up some sort of an administrative? Yes, to, to sort of organize some type of system for doing the administrative support and operations that um, Robin, you know, I mean, he was busy doing the, the actual uh, consultations mm -hmm. with the local government and um, you know, running the, running the project overall from a medical standpoint and uh, strategic okay. view, uh, but being able to get the day-to-day -day support that was needed set up. Um, and then, I don't know how much later, but not long after that, I think there was an, a, per, a permanent public health advisor who was assigned there. And I actually, in 1991, was was scheduled to go back. At, at that time, I think Mike St. Louis um, had taken over as the project leader. And um, I was going to go to replace the public health advisor who was returning 
uh, to the states. And this is, was for a longer term assignment? This would have been like for a two year assignment. Okay. And I was scheduled to go for sort of an introductory visit to see, sort, sort of to, to meet the staff there and, and, and sort of get acquainted and make sure that it was going to be a feasible project for me to, to be involved in. And so, uh, and, and for them to get a look at me as well, you know. So, um, I was actually had my bags packed, uh, had my flight arranged, I was ready to leave for the airport, and I think I had just come out of the restroom getting ready to call a taxi for me to be picked up, and a phone call comes in from Mike St. Louis. He says, I'm currently in my bathtub avoiding bullets that are flying overhead. The police are rioting, and tell Harold not to come. And so obviously I didn't, didn't leave that day, but... Uh, Oh, gosh. And after that, the, the project actually was not able to really get, get really going again, and it eventually shut down, and I think they warehoused a lot of the uh, That's supplies, right. There was a lot equipment. of civil unrest. I think to close the loop, Mike St. Louis and his family did evacuate safely, <laughs> but it was, I think it was particularly hair-raising. Yes. So... Um, I don't know if that was literally true, but that's what, <laughs> what the story I heard was. Gosh. Well, you did make it back to Africa, but a different part of Africa f for two-year assignment. Tell us about that one. Yes, as Project CEDA was closing down, Kevin DeCock had started a, a project in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. uh, and I think much of the imp impetus for starting that project was an HIV-1 strain and an HIV-2 strain had been identified and HIV-2 was more identified geographically with West Africa, mm -hmm. and Cote d'Ivoire was selected as a potential site, and I think Kevin started the project there and um, got things going uh, in the late 80s. And in late 91, after the failure of, of the Project CETA um, episode, then I, you know, expressed interest in going to, to Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Kevin was looking for a public health advisor. And so I indicated interest. And again, I was making an initial visit, I think in, in late 91, early 92, mm -hmm. to, and went to Cote d'Ivoire for a few weeks and then uh, came back and I think it was in, probably in May that we actually went for, for two years. For two years. And uh, stayed there for two years. So the project I think had, by the time you got there, the project had been in place for? A number of years. A yeah. number of years. So what, when you arrived, what did you find in Abidjan with respect to the project? How, had this matured in terms of just even the physical plan and infrastructure, was it? There was a, an, an office, it had, I think it had belonged to the Ministry of Health, the, the building, but it made it, it, it needed renovations. Uh, and part of it had been renovated, part of it was still standing kind of needing mm -hmm. renovations. But there was a central area, there was Kevin, Kevin's office, we had a number of local physicians that had been hired through the embassy. There was an actually uh, um, a local IT unit. Uh, th we had some third country nationals. Those are people who the embassy can hire um, who come from not the local country, they're not Americans, uh, and they hire them at a special salary rate to go into positions key positions that are needed if we didn't have Americans who could fill the positions at the time or um, locals maybe were not able to fill that function, fulfill that function. Um, so I remember Ronan Dorley from Ireland was the IT person. Um, Khabibi Regbasera from um, Tanzania, and actually she was from Uganda. Uh, she was doing the 
administration and operations. Um, but I think as the project grew, Kevin felt that she might need some additional help. And I know there was some concern about how Khabibi would receive a public health advisor, American coming from CDC. There was no, no real thought given to getting rid of her or making, you know, abolishing her position, but we would actually work together. Um, and as it turns out, it, 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 it worked very well, but, uh, you know, she was very helpful to me getting, getting started uh, as not being a French speaker at the time. Um, I had taken some French lessons before I left. I continued to take French lessons while I was there. And by the time I left, I was able actually to give a little going away speech in French. So uh, I was able to at least get around. Most of the project staff spoke of, uh, uh, English, so it was not a major issue. Now, were there any really big uh, sort of administrative challenges that you were facing at the time uh, or that the project was facing at the time that you had to problem solve? Or Well, the, the project was expanding. We were getting more, more staff. Um, there were um, needs for additional space, you know, laboratory space, additional space for IT, uh, space for the physicians. Uh, it, it, was, it was very cramped, the, the space we had. I mean, it was nice space, but it was, it was cramped once it had been renovated. So we, we renovated more of the building and, and made some more space. Uh, and then as we got more involved, there was interest in, in doing a, a TB lab you know, with the negative airflow issues that, that come with that. Um, and that was a learning process for me in terms of what the specifications are for, for doing, for building a lab like that. And of course, this is another thing that sort of harkens back to the idea that CDC didn't have a lot of authorities when it came to uh, doing this kind of thing. We did have authority to do renovations we did not have authority to build from the ground up. Um, and that required approval by Congress. And of course, you understand that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it took quite a while to get that approved. But as I said, as long as you have good communications with the embassy, you, you explain why you need to do something, what you want to do, most of the time there they're willing to, to work with you to get things done. Uh, and they allowed us to use their building authority to, to build these oh, buildings. Oh, so that's how you kind of got around it. And right? yeah, and so we actually built some buildings from ground up and that, that took place over a number of years and we expanded staff uh, substantially. Um, Stefan Victor came in from, um, yeah, from CDC as a CDC employee. I can't remember Pat's last name, but he took over from Ronan Dorley when Ronan left to go to WHO uh, in IT. Um, and... Um, Were you the only CDC public health advisor there at the time? Yes. So most of your st the staff then would be, be local or these third country? Right. So, okay. Uh, other than Kevin, and then there was a physician from uh, Brussels, uh, Peter Geist, or Peter Geist, I think is his name, uh, was um, was stationed there through mm -hmm. Institute of Tropical Medicine, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it was uh, in 1993 that Kevin left, and. Alan Greenberg came in to replace him. Um, so I was there for the transition for that. Um, one of the other things you mentioned, issues and challenges from, from the standpoint of public health advisor type issues that we had to deal with is there was a program to provide 
a safe house for prostitutes. And um, the idea was to provide them a safe place to go. We would test them, provide them with, with the protection from, say, people who would abuse them and, oh, wow. and uh, also provide them with shelter and, and food and so forth. And so we needed a place to, to do this. And, you know, that kind of thing begins to raise eyebrows among the embassy community. And, of course, getting payment to a landlord to pay for a facility to, to house these people. As it turns out, Ambassador Ken Brown was very supportive of the project. And he actually went out on a field trip with Kevin and myself to scout out some areas. Really? And help us find a, a house that might be suitable for this, and, and as a result of that, we're able to, uh, to get that through and, and payment for that to be made. One other issue was um, I remember the embassy felt like they were very short-staffed and resource, needed resources. And when I was there for my initial visit, uh, we we're talking to people at the embassy, and the, um, the chief administrative officer was saying, you know, we just don't have the staff to support another American staff here. I mean, that means finding housing. That means, you know, we, we need to provide a lot of support just because there's another American on post. And so, uh, he said, I, I'm going to recommend to the ambassador that we not approve Harold coming on a permanent basis. And so Kevin, Kevin was very effective in, in dealing with the embassy, um, said, well, is there something that CDC can do that might help, you know? And um, eventually it boiled down to the embassy said, we need a truck and to help us with our general services organization. Uh, could CDC buy us a truck and maybe we could find a way to have Harold come here? So basically they traded a truck for my assignment <laughs> there. Um, Your net worth, <laughs> so to speak. Gosh, that's um, a different way of doing business than, than the cooperative yes, agreement. Yes. But I'm just struck with the ingenuity of trying to make things work and how, and for the most part, it's, as you said, it sounded like people were more willing to problem solve together than just kind of say no and... and In most cases, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, occasionally you find sticklers, but for the most part, I, I, these people were very, mm -hmm. very good to deal with. You mentioned housing. What was life like as an expat living in uh, Cote d'Ivoire for a couple of years? What What was your life like? Your, did you have children there or just your wife? No, our son came to visit, but okay. he was, at that time, he was, uh, he had just graduated from college. And um, so he came after graduation and spent a few weeks with us in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, as a matter of fact, one day I took off a little af early in the afternoon and he and I went out and he wanted to do some video camera filming in the area and we were out just out in the outskirts of Abidjan and he was doing some filming. I was driving him. We still had Georgia plates on our car that we had shipped over there so um, obviously we stood out but anyway uh, on the way back into town um, I noticed this car was getting ready to pass me, and it actually didn't pass me. It was kind of riding beside me. And there was a guy in the back seat who was holding up a pistol and saying, motioning to pull over. And I, a bad thing to do, but I instinct, instinctively stepped on the gas. And, you know, in my little Honda Civic and there in the Peugeot, I wasn't able to, uh, to outrun them. And so we ended up pulling over and, you know, they got out. They shot the wheels out of the car. They actually were shooting at us. 
What? And uh, they actually shot through the muffler of the car, and they knocked some of the air. I mean, they shot through some of the tires. So uh, that, that's when I decided I'd better pull over. And so, of course, they wanted money. They took my wallet, and I asked them. I said, I'll give you the money. Can you just give me the wallet back? And, and, and they actually took my money and gave me the wallet back, which was, was a blessing in, in a way. Um, they took the camera, the video camera. Unfortunately, they didn't have the vital part of recharging. You know, that was, in a, that was at home. Um, and uh, they took the car keys. Um, so I'm here I am sitting in the middle of the road, actually. It's kind of a freeway coming into Abidjan. And I'm sitting in maybe, I think, the right-hand lane. And traffic is going by, but, you know, they leave. You know, we had visited an area where the police academy is, and I'm not sure that they weren't police off-duty, you know, that, that did this. I, I mean, I can't say that mm -hmm. for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. And so at the time, I had very limited French. Um, and eventually, I mean, we couldn't do anything. The car was locked in gear. I had no key. Um, and um, so they took us, this guy stopped finally. And with my limited French, and we were able to communicate that we had been carjacked. And I'm sure if, if, if they hadn't shot out the tires, they would have taken the car also. But anyway, they, I asked to go to the police station. And so they took us to the police station so I could call the embassy. Well, the police station, you know, the, they wanted to go through this bureaucratic procedure and your mother's maiden name. And I said, she's not coming. You know, we, we need to call the embassy. I need to call the embassy right away. And well, it, it took, I don't know, a good 20 minutes or so before they let me call the embassy. I'm not sure that they weren't letting the people get away, you know, before anything could happen. But anyway, I called my wife at the embassy. She had a, a, a job there. And um, she was right next to the um, security office. And she was sitting at the phone at her desk. And the security officer just happened to walk in from lunch. He had just gotten back from lunch. And he saw the look on her face. And he says, what happened? And uh, you know, I had just told her. When I called, I said, do you have the keys to the car? And <laughs> she said, yes, what's wrong? You know, and so I told her what had happened. And so that's when she got this look on her face, and the security officer said, OK, we're, we're on our way. Uh, so they came out. They took care of everything. They actually got the car towed for us. They got the car repaired. I had to order a muffler from the States to uh, replace the car. And uh, anyway. So it all worked out was that okay. an outlier experience? Yes, it <laughs> was. It years. was not the kind of thing that normally happens over there. <laughs> so, um, so for the most part, what would, it was an enjoyable experience. I mean, it was. It was very enjoyable. And as I said, the the embassy community is very welcoming. You know, okay. for the various agencies and people who work in the various agencies, and I think it helped a lot that my wife had a temporary job at the embassy, Good you know. Point. Uh, and so uh, she knew a lot of the embassy staff. And uh, it, it, it was a good experience. You know, we would go grocery shopping with friends. Uh, or even if we went on our, on our own, I could, I knew enough French that I could mm -hmm. get us by order, you know, asking the butcher for what we wanted or, mm -hmm. you know, we could pick out what we needed, and we were able to buy it at the store and uh, order what we needed. But So eventually you had to return to Atlanta. So this was a two-year secondment. Uh, so you left Cote d'Ivoire. And when you came back to Atlanta, did you come back to the AIDS program? Did you, where did you end up after Cote d'Ivoire? I actually came back to Atlanta. At the time, Harold was the director, Harold Jaffe was the director of uh, the AIDS program. Jim Curran had, had a separate sort of 
AIDS office that sort of overarched the various centers, both CID and NCHSTP right. at the time. And um, it, it coordinated all of the offices right. at CDC that were working. So Harold replaced Jim when he left to take that position. And um, Wilman Rushing, who was the uh, management officer for the AIDS program, uh, took a job in the uh, office of the CID director as the management officer for CID. So there was a vacancy there. And so there was an announcement for the vacancy. I applied for the vacancy. I actually was encouraged to apply. And um, I did, and actually I was surprised to get a call from Harold to say that I had been selected for the position. And so we came back. At the same time, my wife's mother had died, and mm -hmm. so she was, she was saying, you know, it, it's, it's nice here, but it, it would be nice to get home also because, mm -hmm. you know, we have loved ones back there that we don't get to see that often. So anyway, we, we came back to Atlanta, and I was Harold Jaffe's deputy in the AIDS program uh, from 94 to 96 when there was another reorganization of AIDS at CDC. And the biggest part of the program um, went to NCHSTP under Helene Gale. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, she was the, the center director, I guess. Uh, she became the center director later, I suppose, but I think she was heading up the AIDS and uh, at NCHSTP. Jim Curran left to go to the Emory School of Public Health. And um, Harold said, I'm, I'm going to move to CID and head up a, a division of laboratories that will have uh, the TB and, and other clinics that uh, will be joining and, and deal primarily with uh, AIDS-related uh, diseases. It was STD, TB, and uh, HIV. HIV. Um, and I think it was Dassler, the Division of AIDS, STD, and TB Laboratory Research. Um, and so I was with Harold as his deputy there in that division until I retired in 1998. Yeah, that was a time subsequently reversed, but that was a time when organizationally at least the laboratories and the diseases, if you will, were organizationally in different centers. Centers, yes. That must have been, was that challenging to have, to cut across centers? Yeah, in, in a way, um, you know, Jack Spencer, I think, was the management officer for AIDS um, in NCHSTP, and he technically got the allocation for funding of much of our labs. Mm -hmm. And so we had to deal administratively, and also um, TB, we had to deal with the TB program, and I guess for this STD, and maybe it was just the STD and the TB portions that we had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Uh, those those divisions because their labs had moved over to to CID okay. and uh, and I guess we had some funding for the HIV labs directly through CID so yeah the funding was was a little okay. um, well then it wasn't too long after that that you ended up subsequently retiring I retired in in 1998 I had had 33 years service oh, I was ready to, for a change. And, and the change, just, uh, just to sort of tie up some loose ends before we finish here, you've, you've continued to, to do a lot of consulting for CDC. I did, and I, um, in fact, I retired on Friday and on Monday, the following Monday, I think I went to do a TDY for a consultation for hepatitis. They were heavily involved in gearing up hepatitis C at the time. And I 
think they were looking for some help in putting together some inform informational materials for the public. And I don't remember all the details of what I did, but I was doing a lot of writing in, in terms of putting together information on, on hepatitis C. Uh, I think it was Harold Margolis that was in charge at the time. Um, and um, if I remember correctly, I wouldn't, so wouldn't be sure that that's right. I, and some of this work has involved international consultations? You've got I, to go out well, in the field some more? Yeah, not, not the hepatitis part. And I also did a brief consultation for the Conference of State and Territorial Epidemiologists in their office in Atlanta. And then later that year in 98, late 98, we moved to Tucson, Arizona. Where we had a retirement time there. We spent five years in Tucson. And um, we really liked Tucson. I was in 2000, I think, when I got a call from Carmine Bazzi uh, and said, Harold, we have this um, officer who is working with uh, South Africa under the auspices of USAID. Uh, in, in the health department in, in South Africa. And he is going to be transferring over to embassy support. And we need someone at the, at, on site to help him with this okay. transition of having his housing and all of his support provided through USAID switching over to embassy support. And so he asked if I would be interested. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll give that a try. And so I was there for a, a, about six weeks or so and worked with him and, and the embassy to get them settled in housing, housing identified, and um, some of the support issues that, that he would need while he was there. So that experience that you had with your two secondments in the AIDS program to, to Kinshasa and then Cote d'Ivoire, you could apply some lessons learned, I guess. Yes, and there actually were limited people at CDC who had actually worked in an embassy-related situation because, as I said, most up, up until AIDS, primarily CDC was a domestic agency, and I think that's one reason. Carmine was, was the CID management officer when I was uh, assigned to Cote d'Ivoire, and he and Wilman uh, made a visit shortly after I got there, and uh, I think that's how he remembered that uh, Harold has this experience. Maybe he could help with mm. this. <clears throat> Interesting. And then after that, Ruth, I mean, um, Margaret Davis was looking for a public health advisor in, in Malawi for her project and Global AIDS. Or PEP, yeah, it was Global AIDS, I guess, at the time, became PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Right. But uh, um, so Margaret called me and asked, would I be willing to come for a while and, and help her? And so I agreed to do that and so spent about three months there. And three then, months? Oh. And then came home for a while and she asked if I would come back, which I, I agreed to do. Uh, so we were there for a, a couple of times and then later just other consultations. You know, my name got bandied about, I guess, as someone who's done this kind of thing. And um, so I... Uh, well, gosh, that's, that's, um, that's, a, that's kind of a nice way to carry on a, a post-retirement uh, blend of, of uh, a little bit of work, travel. Um, that's on. So 33 years you were in government, uh, and then and part of it, a big chunk of it spent working on AIDS. Um, what, um, how do you think working on the AIDS program has affected you personally and professionally? What, that part of your career? It, it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's, been a great uh, experience all in all. Working for CDC, um, you know, I, I sort of fell into the job, but I can't imagine having had something that would be more rewarding in terms of uh, feeling like you've 
made a contribution to um, general health. And along the way, how much I've learned is just amazing. And uh, all of the experience, how they've contributed to, um, I think, my gradual maturity in life and being able to um, feel that, feel a very rewarding feeling. Mm -hmm. I, I think CDC, throughout my experience, has been a really a great place to work and great people to, to work with. Um, well, um, it, uh, it sounds like you've had a fair number of adventures along the way. Is there any, any further closing thoughts, anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to, to say? No, other than the fact that it's really nice to sit down and reminisce about mm -hmm. some of the, the things in, in the past that, uh, that have made your professional career and uh, how, um, how it's led to where you are and all of the things that have been very rewarding both personally and professionally, to to be able to have the opportunity, and I, I I quite frankly feel honored to be asked to participate in this project in the well, oral history of Well, we're glad that you agreed, and um, it's been very interesting having this conversation with you. And thank you very much, Harold. Thank you.